well, let's uh, let's uh, have a look to the to a problem that I I realized just in the last class. <clears throat> uh, there's one thing I thought it was trivial, and uh, while explaining it, I <laughs> I realized that it was not so trivial. The question is that to see that L square and S square are functions of the Hamiltonian. I'm sure of that, but uh, it's not so trivial to, to, to tell why. Eh? Uh, in fact, I have added here a hint. There are no states with the same energy and different values for L square or S square. This amounts to say that the values of L square and S square are determined by the energy. And in fact, this is equivalent to say that those observables are functions of the Hamiltonian. But why? Why this? is this true? Let's start with L square. Um, Ah, oh, you can do, you, you cannot see, oh, shit. You cannot see what I am writing. <laughs> and ah, let me try to, well, let me, let me try to find the tools. I don't know why they have disappeared. Access and uh, switch and meeting. Layout. Ah, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Oh, we've got it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so let's try to. Erase. Oh, and now the tools have disappeared. So, ah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Ah, ah, yeah. Yeah, but the problem is that again. Yeah. A ver. OK. Y ahora. Ah, pero esto sigue dibujando. Draw. A ver. Um, let's try to close the easy interactive tools. Let me see. Uh, all right. Como se cierra aquí, a ver, ok. Ah, no, 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 siguen estando. Y esto, aquí, vale, a ver, vamos a ver ahora, no, joder. ¿Cómo? ¿Alguien sabe en, en Windows cómo se cierra una aplicación? <risa> ¿Cómo se cierra? Pero, pero es que, claro, no, no sale aquí en la pantalla. En el Mac lo sé hacer, pero aquí no. Eh, a, a ver, administrador. Esto estará por aquí, ¿no? Ah. Mm. 
Basta. Easy Interactive, Easy Interact, Interactive Tools de Epson. Plugin. A ver, dime que desde aquí no. ¿Este? Display. No, este será el proyector. A ver, más abajo. Firefox. ¿Cuál? Rex. No, no me suena. Ok, bueno. Well, um, well, I, I, I will try to, to do it with the mouse, but the problem is that I almost can't see the, the screen. Ok, um, well, let's go on. Here, now I have... Okay, well, with the mouse it's, it works. So let's um, consider L square. Well, in fact, in quantum mechanics, no, uh, afterwards in the in the break we will we will try to arrange it. Um, in it can be shown that every degeneracy in the Hamiltonian of any system is always related to, to some uh, symmetry of the system. In principle, we could find, we could, uh, th there could exist accidental degeneracies to, to, to states that by chance take exactly the same value, but this is uh, essentially impossible and in fact, Whenever we found a degeneracy, there is a symmetry that, that explains it. For instance, why the energy levels are degenerate with respect to LZ and to <coughs> SZ? The reason is that we are in, a, in an isolated system, an atom, and Everything, every direction in a space is equivalent because the space is isotropic. And then, uh, since LZ indicates the component along and the component of the angular momentum, orbital angular momentum, along an arbitrary Z axis, different values of LZ correspond to different orientations along the Z axis. That means they correspond, if this is the z-axis, to have an orient, uh, to have a, a, an angular momentum with a positive, with a zero, or with a negative z-component. In fact, amounts to make a rotation of the system or a rotation of the axis, which is equivalent. And so it's clear that an isolated system should have rotational invariance. That means that the energy cannot depend on the orientation of the system along an arbitrary axis. That explains why the energy levels or the terms, which are the energy levels when we do not consider relativistic effects, those energies are independent on LZ and on LX. But, in principle, it could depend on L square and on S square. Um, this is why, why they are... Uh, well, in principle, they commute with Hamiltonian, so there exists a common set of eigenstates of all those operators, but it could happen that, uh, for instance, two states with the same energy 
have different L square. And um, well, uh, the proof that this that this in principle should be possible is that this happens for the hydrogen atom. In the hydrogen atom, um, we have uh, the two s and two p orbitals are degenerate, and this is uh, not evident why. It's evident that the two p x, two p y, and two p z should be uh, degenerate because, in fact, they have the same. They are the same state except for rotations of 90 degrees, but 2s and 2p states have different densities of probability and different uh, angular momentum. And so, why are they degenerate? Well, there is a non-trivial symmetry that explains this degeneration. Uh, this is explained in the book of Galindo and Pascual. Um, I will give you the quote, the, the page, but it's not a trivial question. In fact, in that book, it's called an accidental degeneracy because it's an uh, unexpected degeneracy. But in fact, it's not truly accidental because there is a symmetry that is specific of the potential and 1 over R. So, due to the potential 1 over R of the hydrogen atom, it can be shown that there is a, there is a symmetry that exists also in the classical, uh, in classical mechanics. In, in fact, this is related to Kepler law that states the, that uh, the area that is uh, 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 the, the idea that, that advances the, the vector, the position vector of a planet with respect to the sun is constant in time. So the speed uh, changes in different points along the, the, the orbit, which is elliptical. And uh, well, this same reason is the reason why there exists a special symmetry which explains that degeneracy. There is another problem for one particle systems in what in which there is a degeneracy which is non-trivial, which is the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator. In the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator, the states can be taken. Uh, well, the, the no the. Isotrope three-dimensional harmonic oscillator, that means uh, an harmonic oscillator in which the k, the, the constant, depends only on the distance between the particle and the origin. In that case, there is, there is of course, spherical symmetry, but the degree of degeneracy is larger than expected from this spherical symmetry. And also, for this particular case, for a potential which is proportional to R square, there can be shown that there should be uh, that degeneracy. And uh, it can be shown, in fact, that these are the two only potentials for which there is a special extra degeneracy from the ones that are evident from geometrical reasons. <clears throat> well, for polyatomic systems, this is not so trivial. And um, in particular, the, the fact that the energy determines the value of S square is by, by no means evident because we are considered a non-relativistic Hamiltonian and the non-relativistic Hamiltonian has no information about the spin, has only kinetic energy and Coulombic energy. And so in the Hamiltonian, spins do not, uh, any, any variable related, any, any observable related to a spin is absent. So how can, for instance, if you minimize the energy, you reach the correct ground state? And even if the ground state is degenerate, 
there are several options, but all of them correspond to a single value of S squared. Hmm? Well, I'm sure that the explanation is related to the anti-symmetry of the wave function of a polyelectronic system with respect to interchange of couples of particles. That is the question, that is uh, the, the last postulate we are going to see, the, sometimes called also the Pauli principle. Hmm? But I haven't been able to found the demonstration. <laughs> the question is that the fact that the, the state vector must be anti-symmetric with respect to interchange of couples of electrons makes a connection between the spatial and the spin part of the state vector. And this connection is the explanation, I'm sure, <laughs> that even by, by obtaining the eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian that is independent on the spin, you obtain a result which has the correct spin value. Um, for for two particle system, for two part for two electron system, this is rather easy to see because ah, it's, a, it's a pity that I cannot write. Well, um, because then in any book of quantum chemistry you can found that the for instance, the wave function in the Hartree-Fock approximation, the determinant of the ground state of the helium atom, can be separated in a spatial part and a, a spin part. And uh, for instance, if you consider not the ground state, but the first excited state, the state co corresponding to the configuration 1s, 2s, then you find that you have several possibilities for the spin. You have a triplet and a singlet. There are three spin functions with s square, uh, with quantum number s equal one, and one with quantum number s equal zero. And these two, uh, the, the, the functions of the triplet are symmetric with respect to the interchange of the electrons. So they have to be, they, they must be multiplied by a anti-symmetric function, spatial function, uh, the, the part of the function that depends on spatial coordinates must be anti-symmetric. And vice versa, the singlet state has a, a anti-symmetric function of the spin part and the symmetric function of the spatial part. And so the two eigenfunctions of S square have a different spatial eigenfunctions uh, eigenfunction, and so also different energies. Well, in that case is is rather easy to see it. Uh, next day, if I have if I remember, I will. Well, I, I will give you a reference in which you you can you can find it. But the demonstration in the general case for a polyelectronic system uh, that there are no states with the same energy and different values for s square is, uh, at least for me, is not evident. Uh, and well, I should look for it, but I've I've. Uh, I haven't found it. You can think about it. <laughs> if you have any hint, any good idea of how to explain it, I will give you half extra point in the final exam. And so the first one that gives me a solution for this <laughs> will be rewarded. OK? Uh, anyone who is willing to, to give me the solution, Pablo Ramon, she's typing. Well, Pablo, do you have any? <laughs> well, Pablo, if you have a sphere, you don't need 
the general is a state to express a sphere. I don't, I'm not sure of understanding because you have in that all the directions. Well, the spherical symmetry, of course, is the origin of the fact that energy is independent on L, Z, or SZ components. Eh? But it could happen that two states have different, the same energy and different spin. I mean different S square. And at least for me, this is not so evident because you have Uh, well, in fact, mm -hmm. well, I you have to convince me in a way that I can understand. <laughs> if I don't see, uh, if I don't understand your explanation, you have to make an effort to be more explicit, more clear. Eh? Well, let, let's why uh, let's see the 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 next message of Pablo, but if not, I think it's better not to lose uh, time here, and then you can send me a, an email and we can discuss it, but I wait to see. Okay, <laughs> okay. If you, if you consider that you have the solution, uh, please let me know, eh? and uh, you, you send me by email and uh, I will think about it. Well, the question is that if we admit this, then the consequence is that L square and S square I are functions of the Hamiltonian and should be unnecessary in, in order to specify a single term. But practical reasons mm, have made that we always specify these two values because this is much more illustrative of the properties of the state than just the number of the energy, okay? Well, let's go on. <clears throat> we already discussed this. Yeah. Uh, well, these are several cases in which the, the uncertainty relations led to different conclusions. For instance, if we apply this to X and P, we have that delta X times delta P should be equal to one half the expected value of the commutator, but the commutator is a h bar is a constant and if it is a constant it can go outside the expected value then psi a scalar product psi is one and you finally obtain the well-known relation well this is uh, since we have a modulus the modulus of i is one this is h divided by two so we can never have a state with zero values of either x or p because if the product must be larger than a positive quantity both must be positive uh, in the for instance in the function the exponential function for the free particle for an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian of a free particle. This is a limit case. If we consider a more realistic description of a, a free particle, uh, as you have seen in one of the exercises you are doing for the first part, we can describe it as a wave of packets. 
uh, and the wave of packets has some uncertainty in X and some uncertainty in uh, P. If you make wider and wider in the X axis the, the, the packet, in the limit, the uncertainty in X tends to infinity and the uncertainty in P tends to zero. And the tendency is such that the product still should be larger than H bar over two. Yeah? So this, this can be applied to any wave packet, even for a very, very large wave packet. Yeah? So see, when one of the two quantities tends to zero, the other one should tend to infinity and vice versa, so that the product is always maintained. <clears throat> what happens with LZ, LX, and LY? Okay, we again apply the relationship, and then the commutator. Um, let's, uh, <clears throat> okay, then the commutator is is lz well is uh, i h bar lz <laughs> wow <laughs> very nice and um, so it is not a constant it is it it includes an operator and so it depends. Sometimes the expected value of this commutator can be zero, and sometimes maybe not. For instance, the 2p1 state. The 2p1 is an eigenstate of Lz with eigenvalue 1. So for that state, the expected value of the commutator is non zero, it's a positive quantity. And so the product of the two uncertainties should be larger than a positive quantity, so both must be non-zero. In a 2p1 state, we cannot have a good definition of Lx or Ly. But what happens? Let's go to the 2p0. Same question, but now this is an eigenvalue of this very nice LZ with eigenvalue zero. And so in this case, the expected value here is zero. And so that means that we have no information about those two uncertainties. To say that a product of two positive quantities is larger than zero, is to tell nothing, to, to give no interesting information. And so it could happen that the, eigen, that the uncertainties of Lx and Ly be zero or be positive. Well, in fact, it can be shown that in this case there are both positive quantities. But here we have an example in which also the commutator applied to psi gives zero because an S state is an eigenstate of Lz with eigenvalue zero. And in this case, the two uncertainties do take also the value zero because it's rather straightforward to check that S states are eigenstates of the three components of the orbital angular momentum. If you work in Cartesian, in, in position representation, in polar coordinates, uh, I think I already mentioned in another session that the components of the angular momentum have always derivatives with respect to the angles. And so, since S states do not depend on the angles, the result of applying 
any component in an S state is zero, that means that it is an eigenstate with eigenvalue zero. So when the commutator is not a constant, is an operator, we have to see individual cases to see which are the consequences of these uncertainty relationships. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, well, the last question I have already asked. Eh? There can be a states with the two uncertainties Lx delta Lx and delta Ly equal to zero, even for non-commuting observables. If the commutator is a constant, we cannot have a states with both uncertainties zero. But if the commutator is an operator, we can have states in principle with complete determination of two incompatible observables. So incompatibility does not mean complete impossibility of having both properties known, having both properties well determined in a single state. Okay, let's continue. If you have any question, of course, interrupt me. Hmm? We have introduced the density operator for mixed states, some properties, some examples, and an exercise. Well, this exercise is very straightforward. Fortunately, <laughs> I have added a slide with the solution because I have no way of writing good letters. The the idea, the well, the first point in the exercise was to check that these functions were, were these vectors were eigenvectors of S X. The idea, the hint was to express S X in terms of ladder operators. Which is written here. This is, a, this is immediate from the definition of the ladder operators. And the ladder operator S plus changes when you are in the ladder, in the upper steps, the S plus gives zero. And if you apply it to, the, to a lower step, then the S plus is the following step. In this case, our ladder has only two steps, alpha and beta. So S plus applied to beta gives alpha. And the same for S minus. S minus applied to alpha gives beta. S minus applied to beta gives zero. And so at the end, we obtain the same original state except for a change of sign. Well, mm, let me see. Okay. In the case uh, where here we have a plus sign, then we obtain the same state. And if we had the minus sign, then you obtain uh, minus here and plus here, which is, well, minus, let me see. OK, then you obtain the original state, but with the two terms in the reverse order. So you obtain a minus here. Okay? So uh, both are eigen states of SS. Sx, but with different eigenvalues. Well, then the question is, we have, we express the density operator of a beam of atoms that goes out of a chamber which is in isotropic conditions, and we want to express it in terms of eigenstate of Sx instead of using the typical eigenstates of Sx. Z. Then, of course, we should 
found the same probability of obtaining positive value of Sx or negative value of Sx. So the density operator is 1 over 2 times the projector of the eigenstate with positive Sx, 1 over 2 times the projector of the other eigenstate. Uh, we substitute the expressions for S, S plus and S minus here in each term. And then you multiply, you expand any product in four terms. This, for instance, is this. The first by the first, first second, second first, second second. And the same here. But here, some of the terms, we, we obtain the same terms, but the cross terms have a negative sign. So, so when we adapt, when we add the two terms, this term vanish with this term, this term vanish with this term, and we obtain one over four. These terms, are, the first one appears two times, the last one appears two times, so at the end, we obtain exactly the same operator that, that we would write <laughs> right away that we would write if we consider that we have 50% of probability of finding atoms with positive and negative LZ components instead of LX components. And so both operators are described the, exactly the same physical situation. OK, let's go on. <clears throat> uh, this was, yeah, I think this was all. Uh, well, the first question here indicate how could we prepare a hydrogen atom that emerged from an isotropic chamber in a pure state corresponding to the vector 1s plus? Well, it's clear that if we measure the x component of the spin with a standard lag aligned along the x axis and we filter the state with positive component, we have all the atoms in that pure state. Okay? In this pure state, which values could we obtain and with what probabilities when measuring as z? Uh, we have seen from the third postulate that since here we have our state vector as a linear combination of eigenstates of Lz, the coefficients, the square of the of the coefficients, that is one over two, is the probability of obtaining the value corresponding to this to this uh, eigenvalue or eigenstate of Lz, that is the positive value for Lz, and 1 over 2 probability of obtaining negative value for Lz. And this is exactly the same that happens here. Also here, here the, we have a mixed state, but again, it's a mixture of 50% of the 1s alpha, 50% of the of 1s beta. So of course, if we take one atom with in this state, we have 50% of obtaining positive or negative value for Lz. Uh, well, it is clear that here we have less information than in the first case. Why? because we have just seen in the previous exercise that here, here we have no idea of Sx. Not, we have no idea of Sz. We have a uniform, uniform probability distribution between the two possible values, 50 and 50%, and the same for Sx. Of course, the same should be obtained also for Sy. And here we know the value of Sx. 
because that's an eigenstate. Uh, here we have more information, and that corresponds to the pure character of this state. Well, and uh, the last question is, is straightforward. I leave you here the, the solution that it's very, very immediate. Eh? I don't. I don't discuss it because it's very simple. Uh, OK. We already discussed this. The postulate. OK. Uh, I think we end it here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the expression that tells us what happens to a system that is in that is described by a density operator rho at some time and then we measure some property a and obtain values within so within some interval delta mm -hmm. uh, okay then the state uh, the, the uh, density operator for the state is projected by the projection operator over delta. Um, the resulting state, which is not necessarily pure, has probability one for the provided values. That means that if we measure again the same thing with the same device, so again we are checking if the value is inside this interval, we take the trace of the projection operator times, uh, let me see, yeah, the probability. I haven't seen. This is the probability of obtaining values in a second measurement. So after the first measurement, the density operator is given by this expression. And then we again want to measure the same thing. Well, the probability of obtaining values within the same interval as before is really seen to be one. Eh? Because here we have seen that the probability is nothing but the expected value of the dichotomous observable associated to this projector. And then if we multiply, if we project, if we take the trace of P multiplied by rho, since p square is p, we again obtain the same expression as before. Okay. Well, so the property becomes well defined, perfectly defined within the interval. So again, this postulate can be interpreted as to tell that measures can be reproduced if we make a measure and then we measure the same thing just after, we obtain exactly the same thing with complete certainty. Well, well uh, if we measure a property and select and obtain a non-degenerate value, a single non-degenerate value, the state, the resulting state is pure, and this the only eigenstate corresponding to that eigenvalue, to the obtained value. So we can readily see that in this case, the projector projects onto a one dimensional space. The space, the eigenspace, in this case, is an eigenaxis. And this is the projector corresponding to the value we have obtained. Here I put any density operator, expressed as a sum of probabilities times projectors. And uh, here I have recalled the expression of the postulate. Then we multiply again by p so that we. this is the resulting density operator after the measurement. And in the denominator, I have put the trace 
of the product P times rho. This is P, this is rho, and this is the trace. The trace is the sum of the of these uh, matrix elements of these operators for any orthonormal uh, basis in the in the space. Well, here you can see that if you take this uh, bra and multiply it to this cat, you obtain exactly the same thing, the same scalar product you, you have here, but in the reverse order. So the product of this times this gives this. I don't know why this mouse raises letters. Okay. So that in the numerator, we can put it that way. And in the denominator, if we take this part outside the sum, I. Okay, we take here the sum with the P. And realize that here we have a resolution of the identity, a sum of projectors over all the elements of the of the basis set, then we can put unit operator instead of this, and then we are led with a product of this bra times this cat, which is the same as this product, but in the reverse order. So again, we obtain the square of the modulus of this product. So we can we can simplify this with this and we are led with the projector over a eh? so the result of the measurement is a pure state so we have a system of preparing pure states well of course if it could happen that we are is interested in a state for which the observable A gives, has a degenerate value, and then we have not enough with measuring A. We have to look for compatible observables that break the degeneracy of A so as to prepare a pure state. Okay. Well, the connection between compatibility and commutation. If two observables are compatible, the corresponding operators commute. What means compatible? Yeah, we already said that compatibles, uh, two observables are compatible when, if we measure one of them, obtain some value, then the other. The second measurement does not destroy the information obtained from the first measurement. So after, if we measure A and then B, we can measure again A and we are certain that we will obtain the same result as in the first case. This is readily seen by going back to the case of the three-dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, and here is the generalization to any any case, eh? but let's consider the, the three-dimensional space, which is very visual. Uh, we consider uh, some operator A, which has uh, an eigenvalue which is doubly degenerate, A1, eh? and this is yeah, this the plane, the horizontal plane is the eigenstate corresponding to A1, and an eigenvalue, non-degenerate eigenvalue A2, whose eigenspace is the vertical axis. And let's assume that we have a different observable B, and uh, since um, well, and let's assume that here. Uh, we have, well, we, we are, in fact, we are trying to show 
the implication from the right to the left side. Yeah? So I assume that the two operators commute, and so uh, in theorem five we saw that there should exist a complete set of common eigenvectors. Let's assume that this complete set is these three basis sets. Yeah? C1, C, well, phi1, phi2, phi3. And uh, it could happen, for instance, that the two first are the generic res respect to A, and phi1 and phi3 are degenerate with respect to B. And so, for instance, what happens after taking an arbitrary state, your state, and measuring A? Well, if we obtain A2, projection onto the vertical axis gives, with complete certainty, this vector. But if we obtain A1, the projection goes to the horizontal plane, can go to any direction within the horizontal plane, because we do not know which was the original state. So measurement of A in this case cannot, uh, is not enough to prepare a pure state. But then we measure B. Measure of B, the measurement of B, projects onto this vertical space, which is this vertical plane, which is an eigenplane of B. But the projection keeps A, since it's an orthogonal projection, it keeps this projected vector resulting from the first measurement, it's kept in the horizontal plane. So at the end, we obtain the single, the unique vector which pertains to both planes, which is the psi the phi one uh, basis vector. Yeah? And so the existence of a common basis set of a set made of common eigenvectors warranties that the second measurement keeps the vector in the eigenspace of A and so does not destroy the information previously obtained about A. Well, here I have put it in words. This I have changed the the writing from previous version of the, because it was, it was not very clear. I hope now it is clear. But if you understand this geometrical uh, reasoning, in fact, is the, 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 is the same thing. Huh? Well, um, here I have a demonstration of the other way of the double implication. Well, uh, demonstration with words, you can have a look, but I won't enter in the details. Yeah? The question is that compatibility, the physical definition of compatibility we, 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 we gave at the beginning of my classes is equivalent to the mathematical property of commutation between the corresponding operators. Uh, if two observables are not compatible, eh, I insist, and we have seen in the exercise we have solved just before, that uh, there could be, uh, well, there is not a common basis set, or a basis set made of common eigenstate, and in general, it could happen that the measurement of B changes, takes out the the previous, the takes out of the eigenspace of A the state vector, and so affects the state vector and change the value previously obtained for the other. Yeah. Well, just comment here that for continuous spectra, yeah, the projection is an integral, 
And uh, in fact, for continuous spectra, in general, depending on the measurement device, this integral should be weighted by some weight. Eh? Because normally, if we have that, for instance, if we say that we measure the x position and we obtain a value within this interval. In fact, the frontiers of the interval are not completely sharp. And so the sensibility of the measurement device should be probably larger in the middle of the interval than in the, in the extremes. And so the projection operator should be an integral with some weighting function here. And things are a bit more complicated. But I won't enter in these details. <clears throat> well, first exercise that I want you to think about for next day is to first to consider a two particle rigid rotor, which is a system that in classical mechanics has a rotational energy. If it is isolated, the total energy is given by this expression. L squared divided by 2 times the inertia moment and the distance between the, the square of the distance between the particles. So it's straightforward to write the quantum rotational operator and to find the corresponding eigenvalues. So let's try to to do it and to see which is the how is the the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, what are the eigenvalues and the corresponding degeneracies, and to write the spectral decomposition of the Hamiltonian. Then uh, you will write the spectral decomposition of this operator. Let me see if in this way, OK. In this way, letters do, do not disappear. Then, um, since this is a function of the Hamiltonian, it's straightforward to write the spectral decomposition of this operator, starting from the spectral decomposition of the Hamiltonian. And by taking into account the Boltzmann law, you can verify that this operator is indeed the density operator that describes a macroscopic system at some temperature uh, t. Yeah? That's uh, if you have a chamber with uh, diatomic molecules and you take one, what is the state, the, the how can you describe the rotational state of that molecule? If you have some temperature, not a very low temper temperature, probably you have several uh, levels and rotational energy levels that are populated. And then the only way of describing such molecules is, is with, this, with this density operator. So you take one of these molecules and you measure the energy and you obtain the result zero. The question is, which will be the state after that measurement? And then you take another molecule of the box, you measure the energy, and you obtain the result 1 over mu d squared. And again, the question is, what will be the density operator describing the molecule after the measurement? OK? Try to do it, and we will discuss it next day. And the last exercise 